Hey pals, I'm here today to do a very delayed July reading wrap up. I almost said August, this is so delayed. So I've just had a busy month. I'm now on annual leave for two weeks, but planning for two weeks annual leave is very stressful, as I'm sure most of you can imagine and relate to if you work like office jobs. And probably that happens with lots of other jobs as well. And then also I've had like not great health. My um, FND has been flaring a bit the past week or so because my doctor screwed my prescription up, which is always a joy. Um, today is like the best it's been in like more than a week. And so I'm feeling much better. I thought, while I'm feeling a bit better, I'm gonna crack on and get at least one video done. So hopefully um, my FND will stop flaring for the rest of my annual leave, which would be lovely, so I can enjoy it and also catch up on some videos. So I read seven books in the month of July. Three were YA fantasy, two were literary fiction, and two were non-fiction. So I had quite a mix of genres, but also quite a mix of star ratings. So I'm gonna start with the YA fantasy. I borrowed the Guinevere Deception from the library, and it is by Kirsten White. It's the first book in a YA fantasy, I think, trilogy. The third book isn't out yet, though I think it comes out this autumn, maybe. So, I put this on hold at the library after reading Legendborn by Tracy Dion. I'm really enjoying that. And if you don't know, that is a YA, I guess, sort of urban or contemporary fantasy based around um, the Knights of the Round Table and Arthurian legend. And I really enjoyed it. Um, I also really enjoyed The Lost Queen by Signe Pike, which is the first book in a historical fantasy series, which also has characters in who are from Arthurian legend, like Merlin and Lancelot. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna try and deep dive more into this because I clearly enjoy it as a sort of, as a set piece, like as a group of characters and all that sort of thing. So, the Gwenevere Deception is set in like the historical appropriate setting, it's set in Camelot, and the premise is that we are following a young woman who is pretending to be Guinevere. So the real Guinevere died a year or so ago, and the 17 year old woman is the daughter of Merlin, and he has trained Guinev this fake Guinevere to uh, pretend to be Guinevere so that she can protect Arthur from dark forces because she has some um, magic trained by her father, Merlin. That's the, that's the initial premise, but as you start to read the book you realise there's quite a lot more secrets that Merlin may be holding that neither the fake Guinevere or Arthur know of, and also the fake Guinevere has lots of bits of her life missing from her memory, and it's clear that she's tangled up in much more than she first thought she was. So, all of that as a premise I really enjoyed and I found myself speeding through the first one. I think I've read it in like a day, just really wanted to know what happens. There is some sort of sort of love triangle. Um, one of Arthur's closest friends and knights is called Mordred, and Mordred is sort of the bad boy, so like Arthur is very um, muscled and blonde and good, and Mordred is very um, tall and slim and, um, and dark and sarcastic. And yeah, that's sort of the counterpoint to one another. So it fulfills a lot of fantasy tropes. However, it's fairly slow paced. Um, so, so I was enjoying it just because I like being in that world. Um, I was intrigued by the mysteries. My issue, so, so I'm gonna jump onto the second book. I also read the second book, which is called The Camelot Betrayal. So I can't really tell you anything about that one because it would spoil the first one. What I will say is my issues with these books in general is that and this is an issue I have with the, the next YA fantasy book I'm going to talk about, and I haven't read a ton of YA fantasy that's more epic in nature. Um, most of the YA fantasy I've read, which still isn't a lot, is probably more like Dark Fairy Tale inspired. So if you have read more YA fantasy, and also adult fantasy, I'd be interested if this is common. What I found is, is there's a distinct lack of clarity in um, the politics and the logistics. And what I mean by that is, They'll make a decision to go travel to some group of people and it will take like a day and it'll be really fast and sometimes they'll make a decision to go out to some forest that's got some bad thing happening and they'll be there in like an hour and it's just not believable. These things would like, you know, Arthurian legend is obviously set in, well, depending on <laughs> what historical um, evidence you, you believe. Um, a long time thought to be based in what we now call Wales. Um, in Signe Pike's book, it's written that the theory and legend took place in what we now know to be Scotland, and then the descendants of Arthur moved to Wales, and that's why the legend was thought to 
been taking place there, if that makes sense. So anyway, like, whilst Great Britain is a smallish place, it's not that small. Like, if you're travelling from some of these destinations to others on horseback, like, it's definitely going to take longer than an hour all of your day's ride. So that was a bit annoying. Um, some of the political logistics just were lacking. And I also felt, by the second book, there's things that still haven't been revealed, which I'd guess were like a third of the way through the first book. The second book was super slow, fuck all happened. It didn't, it felt like a real filler book. So I personally feel these should either be a duology or just a standalone that's a bit longer, because I really feel like she's drawing out this reveal that you can guess quite early on and it just becomes annoying. Like the, the, the mystery stops being thrilling and just starts being annoying when it's dragged on for this long. So the last book comes out, like I said, in the autumn, I think. Um, I probably will finish it and like round the series out, but like overall, I gave the first book three stars and the second book two stars. And then the next book is The Theft of Sunlight by Intasar Kanani. So I was super excited about this one. I had it on pre order because I read and really enjoyed Thorn by this author last year. So, Thorn was a retelling of the Goose Girl fairy tale, which I didn't know at all. And I've since realised that it was quite a close retelling up until like the last 100 pages of the book. And I would have given that book five stars if it hadn't been for the last 100 pages. So I really loved the book, my phone's about to die. I really loved the book up until the last 100 pages when I felt that it just really, the plot went a bit crazy, things didn't make sense, wasn't a big fan. Now this book is a follow on, so you could read them out of order, but it would spoil you for some of the characters in Thorn. You're following new characters, but the, main characters in the first book become secondary characters in this book so like I said you spoil yourself. This is a completely original story and I think because of that I just didn't enjoy it because I think what this author did really well in Thorn is she retold someone else's story really well but when she has to come up with her own plot not a massive fan like the issues I had with the previous two books I had in spades with this book so the the premise is we're following a young girl who lives in a rural area and she decides to go visit well no firstly her best friend's daughter is taken by like snatchers and it's a thing that happens throughout this kingdom children disappear and are never found but it's it's never been investigated and a lot of people think it's like an urban legend or like an old wives tale so her cousin invites her to to go visit for the royal wedding because her cousin is fairly high up in the courts and she thinks you know what i am going to go visit because being at the capital may uh, make me more able to find out about what's actually going on with these snatches. So she goes to visit. Within a few days, she's made one of the queen's like handmaidens and the queen finds out that she's interested in the snatches and is like, guess what? I was also gonna actually, actually I think she's a princess, not the queen. The princess is like, I was gonna do some research into these snatches because I think it's true and it'd be really great if you could head that research up and like keep it secret for me. And then like, she immediately starts going into the city, meeting all these criminals to find out more about it. It's completely unbelievable. There is categorically no way that like, the royal family would have something that they think is happening to their kingdom, which is awful, and they would decide the person, and like completely sensitive because they've not acknowledged it as truth for years and all this stuff. They meet a girl and two days later they're like, yep, even though you're from a rural location, you have no training in politics, in fighting, um, any of these things, you're going to be the person we let run it and just go ham. And then also she finds stuff out super quickly, like within days. And if this is so hidden throughout the city and, and the kingdom that people don't even believe it's true, then why would it be so easily uncoverable? So if you took away all the plot from this book, I like how she deals with characters. I like her pacing. Um, whilst no, that's not true. The pacing of the main plot, I don't like. The pacing of character development and like the romances, I do like. The romances don't take centre stage, which is also something I like. But yeah, I just really didn't like the actual story. I don't think it made any sense at all for any of these things to be revealed so quickly. And I also was so annoyed when I realised this wasn't a standalone. I literally got to the last chapter and it ended on a massive cliffhanger and I was just so annoyed. And then it also felt like that cliffhanger could have just been like, there was quite a few like cliffhangers at the end of chapters and it felt like just the same as them. Um, it didn't feel like any bigger like that warranted the book ending over any of those other cliffhangers. So 
yeah, I was really disappointed because I was thinking that this was going to be like a four or five star read and in the end I'd probably give this like a two and a half stars. So yeah, but you know, have you read much YA sort of epic fantasy? If so, is this usual that, I don't know, just things that in a lot of the adult fantasy I've read, even the faster paced adult fantasy, if there's things going on in a kingdom or an empire or whatever, then these things are just not so easily uncovered. Um, things take months or years to resolve and yeah, it just wouldn't happen in a few days or a week. And, and these journeys wouldn't be so fast. Um, things just wouldn't be so easy. If they were, then the world we now live in would be very, very different. So yeah those are those books. Okay so on to the two literary fiction books I read, one of which is The Last House on Needless Street by Katrina Ward, I borrowed this one from the library. In fact all of these books are either audio, library or books I bought but didn't want to keep so I no longer have so that's why there's pictures up the whole way through. So I found this one a real page turner and I absolutely sped through it but I have a pretty big element of the book that I'm unsure about and I don't want to spoil this book for anybody but what I will say is that this is I guess a literary thriller it has horror elements the opening you are told that a, um, a young girl went missing several years ago in this area and one of our main characters Teddy who is an, an adult man was suspected of abducting her um, but he was released they never found any evidence but he has been sort of um, feared and I guess avoided by the community since then. And we open at a point when, when Teddy is sort of remembering that this girl went missing a while ago and he is having trouble with his young daughter. So the book is told from the perspective, at least initially, from Teddy and his cat Olivia. Now that sounds really weird. I absolutely loved Olivia. She had a really snarky sense of humour. She sounded very cat-like, which I really enjoyed. But throughout Teddy and Olivia's narrative, you get a sense that there's something off. And what I mean by that is like, your initial assumption is gonna be, Teddy has this daughter who he says is really hard work. He tells you her and he gets to see her every other weekend. But then he never tells you that anyone's picking her up or dropping her off. He doesn't tell you how he came to have a child. He talks about his neighbours and his neighbours are only ever seeing him enter or leave the house. It's all a bit weird. And you're also told about scenes where he's like not the nicest to Olivia or to his daughter, either from his perspective or from Olivia's perspective. And so your immediate assumption is this girl is around the right age to be the little girl who went missing years ago. And so it must be her. But that doesn't really add up because the police searched his house, there was no evidence like surely somebody by now would have realised that a child's been living there for like five or six years. So the story unfolds. Now what I will say is I think this is very well written on a sentence by sentence level um, this is very spooky um, very gothic her descriptions of the house it felt very um, claustrophobic and like the sort of place you would not want to be stuck. Um, I think she wrote really well from different characters' perspectives. Later on in the book, you get more perspectives, which I don't want to spoil. So I think all of that was really good. I was trying to figure the uh, the mystery out and I, I enjoyed that element. I felt like there was lots of things that were, you know, I was unsure about. I have read some people's reviews where they said they thought the, the sort of um, reveal was, was obvious from the start. For, for me, it wasn't maybe, I wasn't very bright. So my issue with this is that I really, like I said, really enjoyed the writing style. Was feeding for it, was, was loving it, felt like it could be a five star book and then something is revealed and more stuff follows on from that and I just, I'm not sure how that sits with me. Um, this isn't an own voices narrative, um, I'm not sure about the, what the twist is, it being appropriate, being used in a scary book, so yeah. I'm not an own voices reader so it's you know I can't sit here and tell you if it was wrong or right all I can say is I felt uncomfortable and I'm unsure and it's probably best to go and um, look for own voices reviewers or read own voices reviews and yeah so I didn't give this a rating because I just have no idea what I'd rate it basically 
So there's that one. And then I also read Transcendent Kingdom by Yadassi. We read this for my Patreon book club. This is quite an interesting one to read for book club because it's fairly plotless, which I'm sure lots of you know if you have read it. Um, I'm sure lots of you know the premise of this book. We follow a woman who's probably in her late 20s who is studying um, sort of neurology in particular. She has a focus on addictive behaviour and she tests mice and um, is trying to see if there's a way, if you can do something to the brain which removes the ability to be an addict. And the reason she's so interested in that is you find out very early on her brother, when he was quite young, um, died from a drug-related overdose and he fought addiction for quite a few years and Gifty and her mother sort of tried to save him from that and were unable to. And so Gifty has since become obsessed with this notion of, okay, sort of not thinking about what those individuals could have done differently but like what science could do differently so that if this had been discovered before her brother um, was born maybe that he would never have become an addict. So she's really focused on this so we follow her research but also um, at the start of the novel her mother has very severe depression because of the loss of her son and it's um, recently got worse again and so Gifty asks her mother to come and stay with her. And so lots of Gifty's research is into addiction but she's also discussing depression and the book is, I've heard lots of people say that the book is really um, a balance between science and religion. Um, so um, Gifty was raised in a religious family and um, she still has religious beliefs although she's not necessarily um, practicing anymore but she finds herself an outlier in the science community because most um, scientists that she comes across um, are, are not religious and also she's an outlier because she's a, a black woman you know an awful lot of people you'd come across in, in science would be white men. And so she's an outlier in many ways, but the book really is tackling that balance between science and religion. I heard some people say they felt like the religion was spoken about a bit too much. I didn't actually, and I'm an atheist, um, but I still you know, find it interesting hearing how other people feel and view the world, and I thought it was handled well. There was only um, one section where I just felt like there was a chapter where it was unnecessary. Um, it, a lot of the book is about what Gifty thinks, not much actually happens, and there was just one chapter where I was like, you've told us you think this already, like we're not actually getting anywhere. Um, but apart from that, the rest of the book I enjoyed. I'd give this like a three and a half stars, okay? Initially I gave it a four stars. I think the writing style is very, very good. Um, much better than Homegoing, uh, it's very precise. Um, some of the sentences just feel like she shaved every word every unnecessary word out of that sentence. Um, lots of the the thoughts that are written down are articulated really well, so I really appreciated that. Um, but with a bit of distance, I feel like it's quite forgettable because it really does lack much plot. Um, but also because it's quite short, it Gifty does, I guess, change slightly, but not all that much. So there's not a ton of character development or plot. And so for me that makes it a little bit forgettable. Um, so what I'll remember about this book is the writing style and also for me my favourite sections, which is just a commentary on who I am as a reader, there are some sections where Gifty looks back on her childhood um, and what it was like growing up and her relationship with her mother and father and her brother when she was younger and I loved those sections. Like if the book had had more of that in then I probably would have enjoyed it more. But um, yeah. I, I can see why lots of people are really enjoying this book, but I just don't think it will be super memorable for me. The next one I want to talk about is a five star read, I absolutely adored it. I'm going to look at my laptop because it's a very long title. That is Brain and Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teachings of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And Robin Wall Kimmerer is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. And this book is like I said, very focused on, on plants, but um, Robin Wall Kimmerer is a botanist. This book is split into, I think, three sections. I listen to this on audio and the author narrates it beautifully. And I love listening to it on audio, particularly because I listened to it when I was out walking in nature, which was wonderful. Um, but I do definitely want a physical copy and to reread it because I would have tabbed loads. I definitely would have like, read things and probably gone and done additional research. And also it would have been easier to like see those um, delineations because like 
the third section was much more focused on like environmental um, devastation than like the previous sections that wasn't as clear on audio like when you start a new section um, so I definitely want a physical copy of it. This book is just like beautiful. I um, trained in wildlife conservation at university and something I have thought about a lot not just in, in the vocation I was interested in in particular but um, when I hear people talk now and they have super like specific careers where they've sort of created this niche for themselves um, I think that's amazing where people like blend um, their interests. Something I always was really interested in and I found it really difficult to find a course that responded to that interest was that yes I was interested in the natural world and in conserving that but I wasn't interested in doing that at the cost of um, yeah a lot of the devastation is in it like environmental devastation in this world has been caused by um, the wealthier countries and what has happened historically is that white people from those wealthy countries have gone to these um, poorer countries and said this is what you've been doing wrong this is what you now have to do and we're going to basically govern you and like make decisions for for your wildlife after we've killed ours um, and, and after we've also like killed your people and like done all these awful things right so I wanted a course that acknowledged that and um, combined um, sociology with conservation which was uh, what my course did I will they still run it now um, I went to the University of Kent and it was yeah I maybe did one or two modules in the three years that was pure science and the rest of the, the degree was um, every single lecture we'd also discuss um, the people the social impact the politics ec the economics everything and that is what Robin Wall Kimmerer does, right? She is a botanist, but she um, is incredibly focused on um, the social impacts, on how people can live um, and, and think these, these things about the environment um, and enact them in their everyday lives. And in large part, this book is focused on the fact that um, indigenous knowledge, specifically in Native America, because that's um, where um, this author's field of study is the strongest, but she also um, acknowledges this is sort of common in um, most um, indigenous knowledge around the world that there's been this notion of um, reciprocity with the natural world of this if we take then in order to to keep taking we need to give back otherwise we're just gonna like wipe these fuckers out really um, which is something we haven't done in countries like the UK for example um, we live in a country that's entirely unrecognizable from what it would once have been um, we've just yeah destroyed most of the of the of the plants and the um, and the animals here, which is devastating. Um, and so when she she, she brings in a lot of um, sort of origin stories uh, and tells those stories, but but sort of then leads on to what we can learn from those stories. I just loved it. This book is very filled with love and there's lots of talking of the people she loves. So she talks about her two daughters and um, what life was like raising them and she'll sort of talk about a memory and then that memory will lead on to some um, thing you can learn about plants. So it feels like lots of, there is a, th a thread but it also feels like lots of sort of essays. So this is a really good one to sort of read one chapter, walk away or listen to one chapter and walk away. Um, there's also lots of discussions about her students um, she's an academic and she talks about how lots of her students really struggled with her way of teaching and then she talks about what they learned from it and what she hopes they took away from it and I loved it. Um, a few chapters I really loved, there was one in particular focused on, I think she was trying to learn um, the Potawatomi language, although if I'm wrong about that I'll put the actual language here, which isn't spoken by many people anymore, but she says that a big focus of that language is um, on every everything being animate so nothing is referred to as it um, and in doing that you give a, a level of individuality and honour to each um, object and being and I loved that it's something that I, I really deeply believe in and there was also a chapter that was written by one of her daughters which was about an old lady they knew called Hazel who um, really knew a lot about plants um, and you know was able to make lots of ointments and 
um, and had to leave her old home and it was just a beautiful chapter about how it really broke my heart. I cried a lot throughout this book but that one was particularly heartbreaking. Um, there's a chapter where she's trying to um, allow this pond in her garden to bring um, certain species to be drawn towards it. I thought that was really beautiful. It's after her daughters have left home and she's trying to get used to um, living alone again. She spends a lot of time working on this pond. Um, and there's also a chapter um, all about squash, beans and I can't remember the third plant, I'll write it here, um, and how they naturally grow perfectly in the field together, um, but how like white settlers have like, we just don't believe in that, like even though we have personal allotments we still like, I'm going to grow this here and this here and then like, maybe not allotments but in a lot of places we would use fertilisers like not realising that if we just let plants grow amongst one another in the ways they would naturally, they, they're their own like brilliant fertiliser, way better than we could ever create. I thought that was a really beautiful chapter and just the way she gives you the scientific information is, is done beautifully. So this is like why I mentioned my personal interest is because this is that perfect blend of, of science, particularly um, you know wildlife conservation. Um, sociology, which is something I'm also fascinated by, and then just beautiful writing, which is something I clearly love as a reader. Um, so I just think she's one of the best people ever, um, and I love this book, and I definitely want to read. I know she's got at least one other book about moss, which I definitely want to read, um, but I love this book, Five Stars. If you have had it sitting around for a while and meant to read it like I did, then please just pick it up, because it is phenomenal. And the last book I have to talk about, I also listened to on audio, and I really enjoyed this one too, and that is Cultish the Languor. <laughs> Langua, the language of fanaticism. I love this cover, I think it's great. And that is by Amanda Montel. So I heard Hannah over at Let's Talk About Books. No, I think she's changed her name to her own name. Anyway, I'll link maybe that's just on Instagram. I don't know. I'll link the video where she speaks about this book above. And I thought it sounded great. I thought I would give it a go. And so I picked it up on audio and it was a delight. So this book is about cultish language. The book opens with the author saying like, what do we mean by the word cult? We use it for so many different things. Like the first thing that comes to me, I can't click. Let's just pretend I did. I've never been able to. I also can't wink or whistle. Pretty incapable with like things that everybody else can do. Anyway, so, she talks about the fact that the first thing that comes to people's mind is like proper hardcore messed up cults like um, Jonestown and um, the Manson family and that sort of thing. Like we think of cults that like where everything went wrong, where people lost their lives, where like awful forms of assault were happening behind the scenes and where like people were just giving like all of their um, wealth away. That's what we initially think of. But we also say things like um, cult films, cult classics, um, we say that a brand has a cult following, all those sorts of things. And so really the author is trying to sort of firstly say what do we mean when we're talking about an actual cult. She clarifies like what makes something a cult as compared to like a religion because there are some, you know, most cults would argue that they are in fact just a religion. Um, and there's one point where she says um, a cult, a religion is a cult plus time, um, but she also says that what she thinks delineates religions from cults is that um, what makes or what makes a religion a cult is if there is a fear for your safety or your life, um, and also um, they sort of have the ability to take all of your material wealth so that you're left um, incapable of leaving and also in fear for your life. And that's what she sort of clarifies at the start, makes it a cult rather than a religion. So I found that really interesting. But then the main focus on the book is on the idea of cultish language and how you have actual cults, but then how that language, that language used very smartly, although insidiously, by cult leaders, is used throughout um, a lot of things we view not to be cults. So what I found initially bizarre about this book, but works once you get further into it, this book is split into sections and the first section is on like proper hardcore cults. So there's a big focus on Jonestown, 
And then after that, we then look at um, like multi-level marketing companies, sort of pyramid schemes. Um, we then look at um, social media gurus. We look at um, things like, and I'm really rubbish at this, like soul cycle, um, like that sort of, um, where you join a group when you're part of like some type of fitness thing. Can you tell I don't exercise? But anyway, that sort of thing. And she, she looks at all these different facets of um, the contemporary cult, um, a lot of which are um, lived in the online space. And I was like, what? So you're starting with like the juiciest stuff first. Like the stuff, when we see a book that's got cult in the title, the people who are drawn to it are drawn to it because they find cults like fucking twisted, but also deeply fascinating for all the wrong reasons. And also she discusses that, like I have a real issue with so I was interested in reading this because it sounded like it was a more broad discussion of language um, and all those themes. Um, I'm not somebody who would necessarily pick up, although I did pick up a book years ago about Jonestown actually, but, but more recently I've had a real issue with the idea of our, our curiosity with true crime and how that um, minimises the victim stories in order to um, make the, the criminal this sort of anti-hero who we all are fascinated by um, and, and cults sort of play into that right but she talks about how that she says that it's that sort of um you know immediate neck you know when you're moving past a car accident your immediate like instinct is to turn and look um and i completely get that like i've driven past car accidents before and stopped myself from turning and looking and then thinking like by not turning and looking do i look like like I don't give a fuck and it's not that at all it's just that if I was lying on the side of the road questioning whether I was myself or my loved one was going to live I probably wouldn't want strangers gawping at us um but she says actually she thinks that's part of our um our instinct that um historically we'd have we'd have been driven to look at all danger because we felt we would learn from it and so our that deep within us, the, the desire to know about awful true crime and all these things and to look at accidents is because our brain will somehow learn something from that or it thinks it will. Um, so I thought that was fascinating but I was thinking like, oh, we're starting with all this juicy stuff, is this just because, you know, it's going to pull people in? But actually it makes complete sense because she talks about the cult language that these cult leaders use and then the rest of the book she keeps referencing back and saying, you know, we spoke about how um, this would have been used by, by this person and, and you can see this is now used by this brand, this marketing company or this social media influencer and it was deeply fascinating. I never thought I would be at all interested in the way multi-level marketing companies work but I have to say it was possibly my favourite chapter. I was enthralled, so enthralled that I was on a train journey going back home to visit family and I very nearly missed my stop. I was listening and I was just like, I hadn't even realised we'd stopped, for one thing. I mean, I was getting off at the second to last stop, so it was obvious that it was obviously my stop because we'd stopped at loads of others. Just wasn't paying attention, I was just listening. And then all of a sudden I realised we'd been stopped for ages. And I leapt up and the doors were closed and I had to like, do, you know, that panic thing where you sort of slam on the button for them to stay open and then leap between them and hope they don't close on you. Um, my dad was just on the platform like, I thought you weren't getting off, I was really confused, I was like, yeah, this is embarrassing. I was listening to a book about the cults and um, <laughs> I was too interested. So I'd highly recommend this. I think if you're at all interested in semantics and um, yeah, how, how language is used to sell things and, and the, the twisted link between cult leaders and companies or individuals trying to make a profit. It's deeply fascinating. And this is just really well written, um, really clear. I really enjoyed it. I know she has a previous book called Word Slut, which I 100% want to read. Um, I've really enjoyed this, so I'd highly recommend it. So those are the seven books I read in July. A bit of a mixture. Um, the non fit like, is a clear, <laughs> like the way I grouped these is also how my enjoyment worked. So the way of fantasy, didn't love the literary fiction, middle of the road, although, you know, Last House on Needless Street was very weird. I'm not sure if it is middle of the road. I have no idea. And then the non-fiction was great. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend the two non-fiction books. Um, I didn't give Cultish five stars, although I don't know if that's just me being harsh because 
there's not really anything negative I can say about this other than I just want more, <laughs> like it's quite a short book. Um, but yeah, I think I'll get a physical copy of this and I'll reread this maybe a five stars. I just found it, yeah, I just loved it. And she's 27, I've just looked and like, it's actually, oh no, sorry, she's 29. Um, she's born two years after me, which is depressing that she already has two books. And not even, that's not true. I don't find it depressing when somebody already has a book out and they're younger than me. Um, but the fact that she knows so much about this topic, enough to write a book about it, makes you think, like, what have I been doing with my life? So yeah, reading, I guess. I've been reading, although I'm sure she has too. So um, yeah, those are the books I read. Let me know if you've read any of them, or if you're planning to, or if you have any other recommendations. I would be very interested. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!